Hello and welcome back to Abstract Linear Algebra, the video series where we talk a lot about general concepts of linear algebra. For example, we used the last videos to talk a lot about the important concept of an orthonormal basis. And we've learned that such a basis is really helpful for calculations. Therefore, in today's part 20, we will talk about the procedure that gives us an orthonormal basis. This is the so-called Gram-Schmidt process. However, before we start explaining this algorithm, I first want to thank all the nice people who support the channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. And as a supporter, you can download PDF versions and quizzes for all the videos with the link in the description. Okay, then let's immediately start. And you might remember our setup is that we have a general f vector space v with an inner product and a subspace u. And here we will just talk about the subspace because we want to work in finite dimensions. Simply because we want to talk about a basis with finitely many elements. In particular, if we have a k dimensional subspace, we only need k vectors. And now the idea for today is that we take this general algebraic basis given by the vectors u1, u2 to uk and transform it to a basis that respects our geometry given by the inner product. More precisely, what we want to get is a so-called O and B, an orthonormal basis of u. And there we will denote the elements with b1, b2 and so on. And here please recall, O and B means if we take the basis elements and put them into the inner product, then we get out 1 or 0 or in short just the Kronecker delta. And such an O and B is quite nice to have, for example for calculating orthogonal projections. And now this procedure going from a basis to an O and B is called the Kram-Schmidt process or Kram-Schmidt algorithm. Moreover, you could also say what we do here is just an awful normalization of a basis. This means we have to do two things. First, we have to make the vectors mutually orthogonal and then we have to normalize them. And indeed, we can do that for each vector separately, so we start with the first one. So for the first step, we can just take our vector u1 and ask if it has length 1. And of course, if we say length, we measure it with respect to our inner product. Then maybe the length is not 1, but then we can just normalize it. This means we just scale the vector u1 by 1 divided by the length. So the norm of u1 goes in here, and there you should know this is given by the square root of the inner product. Indeed, this is very important because sometimes people forget which norm to use here. In this abstract setting here, there is no other choice, but if you calculate in Rn, for example, you have to be careful to take the correct norm. If you have a special inner product, you cannot just take the standard norm there. You always have to take the square root of the inner product where you put u1 in the left and in the right. Okay, and then here we have our first basis vector and we call it b1. Now b1 has the correct length, it's normalized. And then we can immediately go to the second vector u2. Therefore, this is just step 2. Hence, the picture here is not so complicated. We just have the vector b1 and u2 goes in some other direction. Indeed, we know they have to span a two-dimensional subspace. However, now we want to find b2, which is orthogonal to b1. And you should already see how we can do that. We just have to calculate the orthogonal projection of u2. And it should be onto the one-dimensional subspace spanned by b1. So in short, this is just the span of b1. Hence, if we do that, we get this vector here. This is the orthogonal projection and we know how to calculate this one. It's very simple to calculate if we have an O and B of this subspace. And the single vector b1 is exactly an O and B. So we just take b1 and combine it with the inner product. In other words, here we have u2 projected to b1. And there we have it. This is the whole orthogonal projection given as this vector there. However, we don't want this component of u2. 
we want the one that is orthogonal to the subspace. So actually, we want to have the normal component of the orthogonal projection. And this is really simple because it's just u2 minus the orthogonal projection. Hence, our vector b2 we want to have is given by this difference here. Indeed, it's orthogonal to b1 by definition. However, let's first call it b2 tilde because it's not normalized yet. Indeed, there is no reason here that a normal component has length 1. Therefore, we just have to normalize it in the same way as before, which means we just scale by 1 divided by the norm. So there we have it, this is now our vector b2. And by construction, it's orthogonal to b1. In other words, now we already have an O and B of this two-dimensional subspace. And with that knowledge, we can just continue with the third vector. So in the third step, we just have to consider U3 now. And there we can use that B1 and B2 already span a two-dimensional subspace. So in some sense, it's similar to before. Here we just have the span of two vectors. And we know that U3 does not lie in this plane because originally we had a basis. And there you see, similarly to before, we can just calculate the orthogonal projection again. And then again, we will just take the normal component. Therefore, the only question is, how do we calculate the orthogonal projection in this case? And there you should recall that having an O and B makes this calculation really easy. It's just projecting u3 to the first basis vector plus projecting u3 to the second basis vector. So this formula is really nice simply because we already have an O and B here. But we have the same as before. Actually, we want to have the normal component. So our b3 tilde is u3 minus the orthogonal projection. So no problem at all. And then the last step is the normalization again. So also here, in the end, we get our new basis vector b3. Hence, now we have an O and B of a three-dimensional subspace. In other words, we have to continue these steps here until we reach the kth step. Indeed, as you can see, all the steps look very similar, so it's sufficient to write down the last one. So we have the vector uk here, and the picture from before can be used again. This simply means, we have a subspace spanned by the vectors before. So this represents a k-1 dimensional subspace. So in the span we have b1, b2 and so on until we reach bk-1. In fact, this is an O and B as the steps before tell us. And now since uk does not lie in this span, we can do the orthogonal projection again. And then I don't have to tell you, we will take the normal component again. So the only thing you have to know here is the general formula of the orthogonal projection. And as before, this is really easy because we have an O and B. It's simply given by the sum of the one-dimensional projections. Hence, we have J that goes from 1 to K minus 1. And then we project UK to each BJ. And then we do the same thing as before. Subtracting gives us the normal component. And also, don't forget, the last step is normalization. And then, this finally defines our bk. And this one is the last vector in the procedure. With that, we have our full O and B. So you see, this is a really nice procedure you can do. And maybe it's also helpful to look at an example, but we should do that in a separate video. So please tell me if you want to see an example, and then we meet in the next video. Have a nice day and bye bye.